Ja. Your request. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Can we, Chairman, can we join, withdrawing your request. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, uh, even though even though the votes favor us at this time, in the sense of full fairness and not having scrambling, we would agree to roll all the votes on the amendments till the end. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. I was afraid you're going to withdraw your request. Never, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. You. Chairman, gentleman from uh, Ohio. Uh, in light of that, I, I ask uh, unanimous consent uh, that in the last uh, roll call, uh, which was not rolled. Uh, that uh, I'd be recorded as voting yes. Uh, my, it would not change the outcome of the vote, which was 12 to 1. Right. That objection is so ordered. Mr. Chairman. Another amendment? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman from California. This one should be Clerk amendment. Will designate the amendment. Designated as Amendment 3. Clerk will designate the uh, amendment. Wait a second. Let's make sure which one it is. Which one are they giving them? Amendment to H.R. 5637 offered by Mr. Issa of California. At the end of the bill, add the following. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent the bill be considered as read. Okay. This is the one I've been talking about, Mr. Chairman. Not, not the earlier one we had the problem with. This one is about empowering the FAR Council, the Federal Acquisition Regulations, uh, that contracting officers depend on. The reason for this, as Mr. Murphy said, is we need to let the experts do the expert work. More importantly, we need to have a uniform set of guidelines. Many would look at this legislation, as we are looking at it here today, and have some hesitancy about how to implement it. We need to make sure that there is no doubt that what we do here today will be uniformly implemented throughout the government. Some of the examples I gave earlier uh, and that uh, the gentleman from Ohio gave earlier a potential gamesmanship need to be carefully taken out of the bill. Additionally, we need to insist that it be about the jobs used. That language is not currently in the bill, but it is the clear intent that it not be about jobs created or saved, a very ambiguous term, but that it truly be about the jobs used. Additionally, we believe that as the FAR Council looks at this legislation, they will look at full-time equivalencies in a nonpartisan and accurate fashion. They also will undoubtedly include guidance about efficiencies that may or may not employ individuals. Certainly nobody here would like to have a thousand laborers, half in China and half here, get a contract if, in fact, an, Ameri an ingenious American company can, using only 200 workers and new technology, produce the same product better and cheaper. American jobs are not about make work. American jobs are clearly about meaningful, well-paid jobs that are efficient and effective. So I would hope that the, uh, the requirement here that we let the professionals do it will be completely bipartisan, urge support, and yield back. I would like to thank the gentleman for his amendment. Any other members seeking recognition at this time? Uh, I yes, appreciate Mr. Our Chair. Representative. Mr. Chair. The gentleman from Utah. Thank you. I, I, I will just renew my call to say that despite all the efforts of the administration to try to come up with a definition, they finally threw up their arms and said, we can't do it. We don't have one. And they had every incentive to come up with them. They went, and, and so I see no, no there, I, I don't see any um, definition of what this is ultimately going to look like. We can say, oh, we want to ask. I mean, I support the, the gentleman's amendment. It makes sense. But everybody we've talked to said we don't have a definition for this. If somebody could articulate what that definition is, I'd love to hear it because eventually the administration abandoned it. And there was a reason why they did. So if, the if the gentleman would gentleman, yield, gentleman, yes, I'd be happy to yield. Uh, the gentleman on, on my side of the aisle, I, I completely agree with your, your observations, but the reason for this amendment is to recognize that if professionals view what we do here today in a way that it becomes usable, and let's remember that this act does not tell them what to do with this. As a matter of fact, there's no mandate that they use this material even if submitted, but that it, that it has the ability to be submitted and thus considered 
I believe that the gentleman from Utah is correct that when professionals look at this, they will take the concept of created or saved and turn it into an essential comparison of total efficiency and total U.S. jobs used. Uh, I can't be sure of that, but I have a sufficient confidence that the amendment now before us was prepared for that reason. But I share the gentleman's concern that uh, the SIGTARP has certainly made it clear that we cannot actually count under the conventional Rec system. Reclaiming campaign. my time, I, I, uh, I agree with the amendment. I support the amendment. I just have a, a fundamental problem with the overall bill because we are trying to apply a metric without definition. And when you know, I'm all for more metrics and more information, and, and you know, without creating undue burdensome, uh, if there is a state model that is working, perhaps we ought to just photocopy that and share that with this body and debate and talk about that. I, I'm fascinated with the idea that, that states are doing this effectively and they like it and they've had history and experience with it. Mm -hmm. But what I, my simple overall concern is the lack of definition. And if we're encouraging a metric without definition, then I've I got a problem with that. Gentlemen, yes, I'd be happy to yield. Uh, gentlemen's concern. Um, I do think this is measurable. Uh, I go to a manufacturer in my district who's competing for a particular contract on copper metal tubing for the submarines. Um, they know exactly how many jobs they need to create. They know exactly how many of their employees are working on that particular uh, contract. It's not, it's not impossible um, or even that difficult for manufacturers it, to it, assess the percentage time, of their reclaiming workforce. Reclaiming my time, then why is it that the administration had to eventually abandon this term and, and this notion. They were trying. I think, their, I think their intentions were good, but the execution was, was awful. And, the, and, and ultimately, the experts who had to deal with this information could not back up the data because they could not create a definition that was universally accepted. The, Is that accurate? I mean, would you disagree with that? I, I think the gentleman has made his point. Well, I, but uh, he, Mr. Chairman, I believe I still have time on the clock. You do have time on the clock. Yeah, yeah and so I would. I would yield time to answer that particular question. I mean, is, is my assessment of what the administration did, was that accurate or is that inaccurate? I can, I can point, I mean, with, listen, we're not debating, uh, we're debating this bill, not the stimulus bill, but I can absolutely point to um, specific jobs with numbers behind them in my district that have been created by that legislation. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, reclaiming my time, reclaiming my time. I, I, I I'm speak not, for myself I, and the people I'm who... I'm reclaiming my time. Okay, you asked me I'm talking about, well, I am, but I, I want to narrow it. I'm talking about... The, the, the category of saved or retained. Created is a little different, okay? Retained or saved is what the, what the gentleman from, from Ohio's amendment is about. That's the, that's, the, that's the metric that was tried to put forth in the administration and that was abandoned. Correct? I mean, if I'm wrong, let me know. But we have such recent experience with this that here we're trying to go and do it again when they just abandoned it. I'd be happy to yield if you want to respond to that, but I think that's the accurate assessment of what happened. I don't think there's any doubt that measuring r retention is harder than measuring creation. Uh, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to do it. And I think that both the amendment offered by Representative Speer and the amendment that's going to be offered by uh, Representative uh, Issa allow us to do that. I think there are some easy metrics that you could require private companies to show in order to prove retention. They would have to show... Reclaiming my time? Would you like me to if answer? If there is like an me, easy metric... If, like, I, if you want to ask me a question... I have I limited, you have time. limited time to answer it. Mr. Chairman. Right, well, gentleman can finish Mr. Chairman, I get to reclaim my time. The gentleman from Utah controls the time. If you said that there's an easy metric, I would like to see it. I would like to see it, and I'd like to see it incorporated into this bill. I think that's a fair request. You say that there's an easy metric, I'd like to see the definition. Now the gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anyone else thinking? Mr. Chairman, just just one, uh, just to reiterate what what we've been belaboring here. Look, for for the government has never used this term. We have that on testimony from GAO. Never used this term. We tried it for a year. It didn't work. And now we have a bill saying, oh, but we know it'll work this time. Never used it before. Tried it for a year. Didn't work. Don't have a definition. But somehow, miraculously, government will make it work this time. That's our point. We think it makes no sense to have this this made-up category of jobs retained or jobs saved. With that, I yield back. The gentleman, you, uh, may I? gentleman from Massachusetts. Yeah, thank you. Uh, here, here lies the problem. Uh, if you want to just count jobs created, then uh, an employer can just lay off people 
and then the next day hire them back, and that's jobs created. If you want to make them go through that exercise, they will, they will lay workers off and then hire them the next day, and then they will count those folks as, as jobs created. If you want to make them go through that exercise, but if you allow them to count jobs retained, they won't go through, through that whole exercise. They'll count those as, as jobs retained. And, and I agree. I agree with the gentleman from Utah and the gentleman from Ohio. It's, it's a loose standard because you have to allow for the flexibility of, of that employer doing something that sort of fits our, our description or our definition. And that's why I think the administration had frustration with it. And, and I think you've pointed, you've, you've made a great point. But I don't, I don't think that the gentleman's suggestion is a solution here by just, uh, by just eliminating. I think we have a problem either way. And, uh, you know, if, if you have a suggestion of how we, we can get at that number that we want, we want to accurately reflect what's going on in the workplace, then I'm all ears. But uh, I don't think the gentleman's solution and suggestion is going to solve this uh, either. matter would of the, fact, the it'll, make, it'll make people go through this dance where they lay the people off and hire them back. Will the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. absolutely. Okay. I agree with you. I think you are helping to, to make my very point that we don't want them to go through these gyr gyrations. We don't want to have this gamesmanship of laying somebody off and hiring the next day. Again, that is why I think this, this bill is, problem, is problematic for me. And as Mr. Isis suggested, uh, with real life experience, oftentimes if a, government, if, a, if a contractor is going to get a contract, they may just be able to say to their current employee base, hey, guess what? Good news. We are all going to get to do some overtime. And to a lot of people, that's a lot of new income that's going to come back to that family. And, and, and that may be a way for that company to execute on a, on a contract. And I think we need to account for that because that has a real positive benefit. But again, in this bill, the way that the, with the lack of definition, I don't think we account for that. I think, you know, you've got somebody who's going to make a decision. This person's going to hire 12 people. This one's going to hire eight. Well, which one should we give it to? Oh, let's give it to the one that hires 12. But there are other factors that have to come into a place. And, and I've said it too many times, and I, 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 I yield back with this idea and this notion that if we're going to create metrics, then we ought to define those metrics. With the and we ought not to incentivize bad behavior, so to speak, by laying somebody off and hiring the next day. I totally agree with that. With That's the one of the challenges. With the Mr. Lynch, Mr. Control Lynch the would you gentlemen yield? The gentleman from Massachusetts, control the time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lynch. You know, I, I think. I think this is a good amendment. It's a clarifying amendment because it does get to the point. I, I don't think any of you believe that you know, government contracts don't contribute to the retention of jobs in addition to the creation of jobs. And, and it's even included, the language is even included in the amendment from the ranking member, you know, jobs created or retained. But it's trying to create that definition. That's what this amendment is, and it makes sense to me that because I'm here to, to suggest that through government contracts, we don't continue to employ people who might otherwise not be employed were it not for the government contracts, but that we also then create jobs in addition to that. It's a reasonable suggestion that we try to gauge both. A in addition to uh, outside contracts that might be let from that same firm and jobs that are created or retained at those entities. So it's not easy, but I do think it's worth trying to do, and I think the gentleman's amendment uh, attempts to do that, it makes good sense. So I support the amendment. Would the gentleman yield? Of course. Uh, I think what we are seeing here, uh, and, and all of us I think are being constructive this process, is we are seeing the difficulty with terminology. Uh, if this amendment is, is accepted, I would hope that, that all of us would work with the chairman before this goes to the floor to find common language that unites us on both sides of the aisle. Uh, as you know uh, from your years of see looking at government contracting, when we have a service contract, we require full-time equivalencies. We have terms yeah. that are fairly well defined. And of course, whether you use a full-time equivalency you already had or you pay overtime or you hire somebody, you can get a number that will be used in this contract. And although I don't want to call this flawed because I think the intent of this bill was good, Perhaps, in addition to amendments today, we can all work together on coming up with terms, along with the professionals that will be looking at this over the August break, so that we get to, if 
hypothetically full-time equivalency is, an, is, an, is a term we can all agree to, that we get to that term. But I think the intent of the bill is worth us pursuing. Yield back. Mr. Chairman, just, just in closing, I, I might suggest, and I agree with the gentleman, uh, we, we may want to uh, simply require that the contractor, in addition to uh, listing the jobs retained or created, uh, also provide the the methodology by which they have counted those jobs. Because we are talking about funding that goes across a lot of industries that use a much different, that use different uh, methodologies. And we may just want to ask them to support uh, their claim of job creation or job retention by, and, and to provide to the Congress the methodology that they used in, in counting those jobs. So that might be one other solution. But certainly I, I agree with the ranking member and I'm happy to work with him. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Illinois. Yeah, um, I agree that it's this. I'm frustrated by the difference in the um, in the terminology here. I think that what we're really after is the thing that has macroeconomic and personal significance to to people is the net change in employment as a result of this contract. You know what what the total employment in in full time equivalents would be with versus without this this contract being awarded. And I think that is something the experts can, you know, yeah. get their hands around and come up with a that reasonable definition of. Gentlemen, you back. You back? You back? You yeah. you back? Yeah, gentlemen, gentlemen yields back. Uh, let me just say that um, uh, you know, I appreciate this amendment, you know, and I think that uh, it says basically to us: let the experts work on it. And uh, I think it's a, a very important amendment, and I support it. All those in, uh, actually, um, uh, uh, I'm prepared to support it. And if no other members wish to speak on the amendment, the question is on adopting the ISA amendment. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I have another amendment at the desk. Final amendment. Would Kirk will designate the amendment? Amendment to H.R. 5637 offered by Mr. Issa of California. Without objections, the, the uh, amendment is considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Mr. Chairman, I have already explained my amendment. I will simply explain why my amendment didn't come the first time. Uh, this makes sure we have the right one. We do, Mr. Chairman. Nations of declaration want people to clip jobs, get a job, and then ignore uh, having any jobs in America. Uh, Foster, note the earlier version had looked at trying to come up with a 20 percent of what would happen, and we realized that was ridiculous. If somebody plays by the rules and the numbers don't come out exactly, contracting offers who continue to use them, if they choose it to get uh, to courage a, a job because of the amount of employment to deliver it, they certainly would already be eligible for debarment. This simply says voluntary submission would cause that possibility to, uh, and I think it gives uh, some pause to people who are arbiters that they have no intention. Uh, we believe it's simple. Uh, it is a tool that is not required to be used but would then be available pursuant to the existing uh, rules of uh, Federal procurement. And I would urge all those uh, to support it and yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman for his amendment. Do any other members seek recognition at this time? Oh. Gentleman yes. from uh, Illinois. Yeah, this it, it's my reading of this that even a, a small error, so that you barely exceed the number that are actually created, would actually trigger potential disbarment. Uh, if the gentleman would yield. Yes. Debarment is available under a set of guidelines uh, already in all the agencies. Uh, this committee, and if you don't mind, a little extensive, in the previous Congress had an extensive one on a fellow who received a procurement requirement for ammunition for AK-47s that required production. He went to Eastern Europe, bought Chinese, Chinese Communist early stuff from Vietnam era and sold it to us. Needless to say, he was debarred personally and his company. That would be an example of the egregious behavior. But debarment is not used all that often, and this does not require debarment. It puts the same discretion that they always have, and debarment is appealable. No, yeah, I was just wondering if, if the member might um, consider softening it slightly to, to require that um, the number of jobs created must significantly 
exceed. The number promised must significantly exceed those so that the threshold would not be you know, a tiny one. If the staff can be empowered to pencil up the, uh, the inclusion of the word uh, significant, I would accept that as a secondary amendment uh, happily. Gentleman from Illinois, uh, from Indiana. It's close. <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, uh, Lincoln got all of his real intelligence when he lived in Indiana from the time he was 12 to 21, so Lincoln really came from Indiana. I uh, just thought I'd add that as an aside. Let me uh, just ask this question. Let's, Mr. Issa, I'm asking this question of Mr. Issa, but I'll wait till he's ready. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes. <laughs> uh, Mr. Issa used as an example his company. And let's say that he uh, applied for a government contract and said that his, uh, his company would create X number of jobs and a competitor said their company would provide X number of jobs. And uh, his company got the contract, but uh, uh, rather than uh, create uh, all these new jobs, he realized that with the current staff that he had, he could provide uh, the product at a better price by having overtime paid. Now, how do you determine the overtime that's paid as an equivalent to the jobs that would have been created by the other company? In other words, the question I'm asking is, I, I don't know how you really uh, uh, show the difference. Because you may do the job, you may be able to uh, do it for more efficiently for less money, uh, with fewer employees once you get the contract because you have people that have expertise that can do the job, whereas the other company may have to hire people that don't have the expertise and train them, but they can do it for a, a, a fairly close amount of money. So how do you ascertain the equivalency? The gentleman would yield. Yeah. Uh, I believe this is where the FAR is going to do this committee a great service. I believe they are going to interpret the language as full-time equivalencies. I believe they are going to weight, uh, for example, the benefits of overtime pay at time and a half, the advantages uh, to the overall economy. Mr. Foster was, was talking in terms of exactly that, its impact to the economy. And so if I pay 20 hours of overtime per week to a group of people who already work 40 times, it is the equivalent of 30 hours of full-time uh, work. Uh, for 30 hours of work and in benefit to my employees and thus benefit to the economy. Well, let, let, let me just say that my concern is that you will have people in the bureaucracy making subjective judgments on these things. And that concerns me because when they make a subjective judgment, other factors may come into the decision making process, like they may have. Uh, may like one employer over another, one contractor over another. And so if you go, it seems to me you have to have pretty hard and fast rules rather than allow a subjective judgment to come into play when you are talking about awarding substantial government contracts and having a bureaucrat making that decision. We already have corruption. We already have corruption in several agencies that we have talked about in this committee where one contractor gets preferential treatment for one reason or another. And when you have this kind of subjective judgment, it, re it really concerns me uh, that, uh, that you are turning this over to somebody that may have other reasons to award a contract. I may be off base, but it really is one of the things I think should be considered. Any other members seeking recognition? I appreciate the ranking member's efforts, and I am prepared to accept the uh, amendment you know, as amended. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, opposed. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Okay. Um, we're going to postpone the, the vote on the, on the um, Jordan Amendment. We're going to quit. And yeah, we are now going to um, uh, take up the Welch bill, and of course, let me just remind all of the members that we have a vote after the Welch bill. And we'll do this very quickly. Um, the committee will now consider H.R. 5366, the Overseas Contractor Reform Act, which was in introduced by Representative Peter Welch. This bill requires that any person convicted of violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act of 1977, the F. CPA 
be proposed for debarment from any further contracts or grants with the Federal Government. Furthermore, the bill makes it Federal policy that no contracts or grants should be awarded to any individual or companies who violate the FCPA. Yeah. Just, will the clerk now report the H.R. 5366, a bill to require the proposal for debarment from contracting with the Federal Government of persons violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act Without of 1977. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman from uh, Mr. Welch for uh, five minutes. Explain uh, his. Uh, thank you, Chairman Towns and Ranking Member Issa, for allowing me to bring this bill before the committee today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you know, our soldiers and sailors, uh, often while in harm's way, abide by a military code of conduct, frequently that's at their peril. But private contractors don't. And in 2007, Blackwater employees allegedly shot and killed 17 Iraqis in the now infamous Nassau Square massacre. Two months later, Blackwater quietly funneled about $1 million in bribes to Iraqi officials to quiet the public uproar over the killings. And according to the reports, the president of Blackwater at the time, Mr. Gary Jackson, personally approved those bribes. All of this happened while Blackwater was collecting billions of dollars in taxpayers' uh, money to continue, millions of dollars to continue to conduct business in Iraq. My bill seeks to root out companies who tarnish the good name of our country and, I would say, our military, and also waste taxpayer dollars. The bill allows the government to debar any company found guilty of a violation of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act of 1977. It's a common sense, simple, and responsible bill to protect the use of our taxpayer dollars and the reputation of our military in our country, and I urge support for this bill. I yield back. Any other members seeking recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Gentleman from California. I would ordinarily not uh, support a automatic or a mandatory debarment. But I do think the, uh, the gentleman's consideration in this particular case is one that is noteworthy. The minority will offer no amendments. Uh, we would like to continue looking at whether there should be some out clause further than, than uh, presidential intervention. But at the same time, I believe that operating illegally outside the U.S., bribes and the like, are a good example of where there should be as close to zero tolerance as possible. And I support the gentleman's uh, bill and yield back. Right. Hearing no amendments, the question is on H.R. 5366. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 5366 is agreed to, and without objection, H.R. 5366 is ordered, reported favorably to the House. The unfinished business is Mr. Design, the Jordan Amendment to the Murphy Bill. Clerk will be designated the amendment. Yeah. Unfinished business is the, um, uh, the unfinished business is on the Jordan to the uh, Murphy uh, Bill. And of course, would the clerk now uh, designate? Mr. Towns. Yeah, the amendment. Designate the amendment. Designate the amendment. Yeah. Amendment to H.R. 5637 offered by Mr. Jordan of Ohio. Page 2, lines 19 and 20. Strike. Cook would now call the roll. Mr. Towns. No. Mr. Towns votes no. Mr. Kanjorski. Mrs. Maloney. Mr. Cummings. Mr. Kucinich, Mr. Tierney, Mr. Clay, Mr. Clay votes no, Ms. Watson, Mr. Lynch, Mr. Lynch votes no, Mr. Connolly, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Cooper, Mr. Connolly, Mr. Connolly votes no, Mr. Quigley, Mr. Quigley votes no, Ms. Captor, Ms. Captor votes no, Ms. Norton, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Davis, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Cuellar, Mr. Hodes, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy votes no, Mr. Welch, Mr. Welch votes no, Mr. Foster, Mr. Foster votes no, 
Ms. Speer? Ms. Speer votes no. Mr. Driehaus? Mr. Driehaus votes no. Ms. Chu? Ms. Chu votes no. Mr. Issa? Mr. Issa votes aye. Mr. Burton? Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Micah? Mr. Duncan? Mr. Duncan votes aye. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Westmoreland? Mr. McHenry? Mr. McHenry votes aye. Mr. Bilbray? Mr. Bilbray votes aye. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes aye. Mr. Flake? Mr. Flake votes aye. Mr. Fortenberry? Mr. Chaffetz? Mr. Chaffetz votes aye. Mr. Schock? Mr. Luke Kamire? Mr. Luke Kamire votes aye. Mr. Gow? Mr. Gow votes aye. Mr. Schuster? Mr. Schuster votes aye. Mr. Van Mr. Uh, Chairman? No. Mr. Van Hollen votes no. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Kucinich? Uh, Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Gentlemen. Yes, well, you're gentlemen. Not recorded. recorded. Okay, I vote no. Mr. Uh, Kucinich votes no. Gentlewoman from New York? No. Ms. Maloney votes no. Any other members seeking recognition? Any other members seeking recognition? Yeah. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there's folks. Hold, hold on, just hold on one second. 15 okay. ayes, oh. 12, I'm sorry, 12, 15 noes, 12 ayes. All right. Uh, amendments not agreed to. Questions on. Now the question is on final passage. All in favor? As amended, all in favor? Aye. Oppose it? No. And the, the chair, the ayes have it. Mr. Chairman. And, no, and, and, all right. An amendment is agreed to. Okay. Now ref referred to the House as amended. We yeah. With commemoratives. Where is the post office? Where is it? Sit down. You okay. Sit down. A quorum now being present. Our final order of business is marking up several post office naming bills and commemorative resolutions. I ask unanimous consent that these resolutions and bills be considered in block and read and open to amendment at any time. The clerk will designate the bills. HRES 1428, recognizing Brooklyn Botanic Garden on its 100th anniversary of the preeminent horticultural ha attraction in the borough of Without Brooklyn. Without objection, they're considered as read. Having satisfied the committee's criteria, each of these measures are worthy of support, and I therefore urge uh, their adoption. And I now recognize the ranking member for his comments on these bills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have reviewed the postal namings and commemorative resolutions before the committee today and find that they meet the standards of our committee. I would like to take a special moment, though, and thank the chairman and his staff for their work allowing us to have the consideration today of Mr. Ryan's post office naming on such short notice as my distinguished colleague from uh, Wisconsin introduced the bill just yesterday, but it did meet the requirements. 
This kind of bipartisan uh, consideration and exemption is particularly appreciated. It is an example where this committee rises above petty politics in order to get the job done. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I urge support for all the bills and yield back. Thank, thank you very much. Thank the gentleman from California for his kind words. I now recognize the gentleman from Utah. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to voice concern about the, the sheer number and quantity of uh, sports resolutions that, that come before the, the House of Representatives. Uh, we team to, to, to tend to deal with these in a very uh, rapid manner. I appreciate that. But what happens is these suspension bills then, then go out and they get 40 minutes of debate. And I, I just come from, the, from a perspective that says, you know what, enough is enough. I have co-sponsored, I have voted for and supported various sports resolutions, but they have become so numerous and so pervasive that I feel like we're overstepping. Here, one of them's uh, H. Res 1546, congratulating the Washington Stealth for winning the National Lacrosse League Championships. I mean, they're just... It, it, there, is, there is a way to recognize sports figures, sports accomplishments. You can submit something to the record, have something nice printed up, hand it to the mayor, go to a parade, whatever you need to do. Um, and, and perhaps the time has come, and I'd like to offer a suggestion on how to help kind of solve this. And my suggestion is that maybe perhaps the chairman and the ranking member of this oversight committee that deals with these could perhaps quarterly sponsor a bill by which all these sports commemorative uh, type things could be put into. That way we'd deal with it maybe if we did it quarterly, maybe we could do this just four times a year instead of literally sometimes four, five, six times a week on the floor of the House. It would save a tremendous amount of money, a lot of time. Members would then be able to recognize their local lacrosse team. Uh, uh, but Please, we've got to change the way we do business here, and we've got to raise the bar up a little bit. These sports commemorations are somewhat new, as I understand it, in just the last 12 years or so, but they've become so pervasive. I think we would find broad support on both sides of the aisle. I think both sides of the aisle have abused this and gone too far, but I think you'd find broad support on both sides of the aisle. So a quarterly, almost like an omnibus or unblock, that the two, the, the ranking member and that the chairman sponsor, and that we put these into one kind of sports-oriented thing. That's my suggestion. That's my concern that we're wasting so much time Would, and would money. the gentleman yield? Yes, please. No one knows more about the importance of sports than someone with your background. I join with you and say that I'd like to work on a, uh, with the chairman to come up with, and the speaker, to come up with a system to streamline these going to the floor so that they don't occupy the important time we should be spending on budget resolutions. Yield back. Yeah, I'd I, uh, like to, to thank the uh, gentleman for his um, comment, and um, uh, it's something that we can you know, look into, uh, but I also want to caution you the fact that, uh, you know, sports resolutions are only important to the person that's sponsoring them, <laughs> not to anybody else most of the times. So I want you to keep that in mind as well. And of course, uh, uh, but, you know, I agree with you, a lot of time is spent, you know, uh, and uh, your suggestion is um, um, well, um, uh, uh, it, it, we will definitely look into it and, and, uh, uh, and see in terms of what happens because, you know, you're right, we do waste a lot of time. And sometimes, you know, uh, we could do it otherwise. But the point is that. Uh, try, try, just trying to offer a solution where people can get the recognition for their local sports, whatever, at, at the same time, not take 40 minutes of debate on the floor of the House and all the resources to go into it. I appreciate the consideration and look forward to working with you and coming up with something that's palatable to everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, on that note, I ask unanimous consent that the measures previously designated and amended be reported favorably by the committee. Without objection, so ordered. This concludes our business for the day. And I would like to just indicate that um, I'd like to put in the record. Um, would like to submit uh, a statement for the record from uh, Mr. Lynch. Uh, he has some concerns, Mr. Lynch, with H.R. 5815, and he would like to work with the chairman and the ranking member on this bill before we go to the floor. I have no objections. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make technical and conforming changes to all matters ordered reported. And without objection, so order. Now the committee now stands adjourned.